Texas to break their contracts and travel south of the border to play. Larry McPhail, president and general manager of the Yankees, sought injunctions against the owners of the Mexican League and sports writer Rudd Rennie of the New York Herald Tribune. This man Rennie has gone right into the Yankee dressing room with propositions to my players on behalf of Mexico. Tongue-in-cheek, John Lardner, sports columnist of Newsweek, comments on the charge against Rennie. I am empowered to state at this time that Rennie was merely an innocent decoy in the operation. While he was in the Yankee dressing room trying to get a recipe for spaghetti with clam sauce from Joe DiMaggio, a small party of true agents, headed by your correspondent, took the rest of the Yankees aside and offered them $500,000 a year apiece for five years to play in Mexico, with a $2 million bonus for signing. Uh, one of the players, whose name I'll not mention for fear of jeopardizing his job, asked for Mexico itself, saying he would not play for anything less than they gave Cortez. Since Mexico has already been promised to a batting practice pitcher on the Philadelphia Phillies, we were not in a uh, position to make the deal. <laughs> oh, boy, yes. Sports are definitely on the boom, and the public is hungry to watch and hear about sports. Last week in Pompton Lakes, New Jersey, Stan Lomax, veteran sports commentator for the Mutual Network, pulled a stunt for his listeners. <laughs> boy, and what a stunt. This Lomax is going into the ring with Joe Lewis. See, he's, he's going to box with Lewis and at the same time broadcast how it feels. You'll be sorry! This Lomax has an idea a lot of fighters should have had before, maybe. He wears a reinforced catcher's mask inside of which is a lip microphone. Also, he has on a chest protector and shin guards. He has on bright purple oversized silk shorts, which makes his legs look like two toothpicks covered with white enamel paint. You'll be sorry! They go out in the center of the ring, and Lewis starts tapping gentle-like on the catcher's mask. I guess every time this happens, it sounds over the air like Lomax's jaw is being broke. Finally, Lomax takes a quick pratfall and an about. <laughs> I guess he still don't know how it feels. Oh, announcers, announcers, such nerve, such aplomb. Soon they'll broadcast from inside the atomic bomb. <laughs> Lord, I was born about three of the clock in the afternoon with a white head and something of a round belly. For my voice, I have lost it with hollowing and singing of anthems. To approve my youth further, I will not. The truth is, I am only old in judgment and understanding, and he that will caper with me for a thousand marks, let him lend me the money and have at him. So spoke Sir John Falstaff on the stage of the Century Theater in New York City. Theatrical history was made last week when the Old Vic Repertory Theater from London opened in New York to the acclaim of the critics. Hey, Mac, get a load of the line of people. Must be seven, eight blocks long. It must be nylons. No, I don't think so. Come on, let's take a gander. See what's cooking. Okay. Holy smoke. Hey, look at that. Shake us, Pierre. Perhaps we are confronted with a synthetic depression, but there were no signs of it at the Century Theater last week. There might not be manufactured goods on which people could spend their ready cash, but entertainment of high caliber could ask almost any price. Twelve dollars a seat for the opening night at the Old Vic deterred no one at all. Seats for the six weeks of repertory simply cannot be had. More than $50,000 passed through the box office the first week. No signs of a depression here. Oh, they went to see Shakespeare at 12 bucks a seat, but in school, William Shakespeare, they never did read. Soon one morning, death come creeping in my room. Soon one morning, Death come creeping in my room. Like most depressions, the present one, even though it is synthetic, has been accompanied by an increase in crime. In New Iberia, Louisiana, an apprehended criminal was about to pay the penalty for his crime, murder. Soon one morning, death come creeping in my room. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do to be saved? 
Seventeen-year-old Willie Francis, sentenced to die for murdering a druggist, was about to be electrocuted when something went wrong. What went wrong, Frank? Short circuit, Warden, I guess. That confounded wire burned out. How's Willie Francis? Okay, he's back in his cell. He says it didn't do any more than tickle. Later, in his jail cell, Willie Francis clutched his prayer book tight and stopped humming a spiritual long enough to say... The Lord was with me last night, and he's with me now. Soon one morning, death come creeping in my room. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do to be saved? Eight miles away in their ramshackle cottage, Willie's family laughed and cried for joy. The hired hearse and the tombstone bought with borrowed money were for the moment forgotten. Then, another electrocution was ordered. But by failing to die on schedule, Willie had aroused legal interest throughout the nation. To his defense came a local lawyer, a longtime friend of the man Willie killed. He insisted... The official argument that the court ordered electrocution until dead, and that the date doesn't matter, is poppycock. The second execution can't take place. How many times does a man have to go to the chair to atone for his crime? Louisiana's acting governor, Emil Verre, granted a stay of execution. As the state Supreme Court began studying the case, Willie's lawyer cited a legal precedent. He recalled the case of Willie Purvis, who in 1894 escaped hanging when the noose slipped. Come listen, all you people, come listen to my tale Concerning Willie Purvis, who was wrongly sent to jail They put him on the scaffold and the trap, it was sprung But the hand of God had saved him, and Willie never hung Oh, it's Willie never hung, Willie never hung The thickest rope, it split and broke, and Willie never hung Twenty-five years thereafter, a certain man confessed that he had done the crime which had caused Willie's arrest. And everyone gave thanks with many a hymn and song, for the hand of God had saved him, and Willie never hung. Oh, it's Willie never hung, Willie never hung. The thickest rope had split and broke, and Willie never hung. Yes, there is a synthetic depression confronting the country, but the students of Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, don't seem to be frightened by it. Last February, Professor of Economics Stanley Ross started something on the quiet Northampton campus. Women own or control 65% of the nation's wealth. Yet many of them do not have practical knowledge of investment or finance. As a step toward remedying that, I am suggesting to this class that you form an investment company to get practical experience. The girls jumped at the idea and incorporated under Massachusetts law. They proposed to offer 5,000 shares at a dollar each to relatives and friends, but a hitch arose in the Securities and Exchange Commission. I'm sorry, Miss Miller, but the rules don't allow you to incorporate for $5,000. But that's ridiculous. After all, this is simply a practical experiment. The rules require at least $50,000 of capital. Well, then we must make a special appeal to the commission for exemption from all its rules. Last week, the SEC hearing on the application set a record. Four and one-half minutes. Since there are no objections from the SEC staff, the appeal from the Smith College girls for exemption from the rules is granted. And so the Smithies are now free to risk their uh, shirts. I got a daughter and she goes to Smith. She's the kind of a daughter I'm delighted with. She formed a corporation. Now she sends me an allowance. One word which has frightened the American people during this paradoxical situation of depression and boom is inflation. But inflation holds little terror for Alvin H. Hansen of Harvard University. With the death of Lord Keynes last month, he succeeded to world leadership of Keynesian economics, a school which takes deficit finance, managed currency, and low interest in its stride. Hansen, whose green eye shade makes him look like a newspaper copy reader, spoke his mind last week to newspaper men at the Harvard reunion. You care to make any prophecy about the future, Mr. Hansen? Well, I'll have to hedge a little. <laughs> well, go ahead and hedge. Well... My prophecies are predicated on the continuance of high taxes, 
Retain savings and price controls until scarcities are overcome. Well, if all those continue, what do you see in your crystal ball, Mr. Hanson? The strength of collective bargaining will not permit a profit's inflation. The surest way of going into a tailspin. What about the $225 billion of savings the American people have put away? There's no reason to believe we can't handle that much money. In fact, within 20 years, we shall probably need twice as much. You don't think that much money lying around is bound to increase the cost of everything? The whole history of our country has proved that as productivity and income rose, we have needed vaster supplies of money. Over the long run, a country as productive as the United States is far more in danger of not having buyers for its products than of inflation. Oh, the experts, the experts, they sure know the dirt, but I still wish I knew how to buy a white shirt. <laughs> So, as the American people are confronted with a strange mixture of depression and boom, they ask, what can be done about it? They've had a belly full of strikes. The United States Senate talked mightily about the coal strike last week, but took no action. They threatened anti-labor legislation, but at the end of the week, it was still no more than a threat. And the president? Well, the highlights of President Truman's week included a speech denouncing moron motorists who imperil highway safety. I got the Depression prosperity blue. A quiet birthday observance, the president's 62nd. And a gift from his daughter Margaret, a sculptured replica of her hands. Lots of money in the bank, but I can't buy a car. And an honorary college degree from Fordham University in New York City, the president's 7th since entering the White House. I'm rich, I'm poor, how are you? I'm snafu. Yes, the nation is in the grip of a fantastic economic plague. Wealth and poverty, employment and unemployment, plenty and scarcity. The teamwork which made our magnificent war effort possible is missing. Individuals and groups are no longer pulling together. The result is confusion. There is no easy solution. In the last analysis, the cure will lie with a public which has armed itself with the facts. A public which refuses to let itself become bewildered. A public which speaks with a clarity of judgment which only knowledge can provide. Such an informed public can exert democratic pressures for the solution of each of the problems involved. And so whether we sink deeper into a state of limping confusion or whether we start working together toward a full life and economic security is in the long run up to you who make the news. Our broadcast next week will be our last in this series. But we'll be back in the fall. In the meantime, listen next week at the same time over many of these stations when the Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with the editors of Newsweek magazine, who believe that a well-informed public is America's greatest security, will again present You Make the News. You Make the News is a Phillips Leader Seymour production. Stats Cotsworth is the narrator. The music is composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. The songs were adapted and sung by Tom Glazer. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.